Hi everyone, we're back with Lecture 22 on the Early Civil Rights Movement. In our last lecture, I spoke about the 1950s as the supposed age of affluence where symbols of wealth abounded on TV and in people's garages. However, the American dream was still forcibly out of reach for most African Americans during the 1950s. Segregation in housing, in schooling, and in social areas was very much the norm. However, we see many returning black veterans from World War II, along with a younger generation of activists in the NAACP, beginning to mount challenges to this oppressive life of unending discrimination. Specifically, we will see the NAACP's legal team finally managing to overturn segregation in public schools. The decades-long effort to end the segregation of white and black school children in public school systems uh, comes about with the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954. Here we will see the Supreme Court of the United States finally deciding that separate but equal was not that in reality. The NAACP presented a mountain of evidence uh, from interviews that they had conducted for years across school systems. They found, for example, that all black schools were routinely underfunded in comparison to all white schools. Black teachers were paid lower salaries than their white counterparts. Black students had fewer and older textbooks. Black schools were chronically overcrowded and the facilities were falling into disrepair. By every measure, the notion of separate but equal was proved to be a lie by civil rights advocates. The Supreme Court will ultimately intone that separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. This decision was incredibly important, a major victory for civil rights advocates. Because if schools, public schools, can now be integrated, then that paves the way for challenging the segregation of libraries, of hospitals, of restaurants, of, of many other areas uh, throughout the country. Unfortunately, we will see an immediate and very ugly backlash among white Southerners to the Brown versus Board of Education decision. As one historian has dubbed it, a massive resistance among Southern whites will emerge. White politicians in the South denounced this decision and promised their constituents that they would fight the integration of schools. White communities throughout the region began to mobilize in order to block the integration of black and white students. And the clearest example of this massive resistance among white Southerners will be the formation of white citizens councils in the wake of the Brown decision. White citizens councils were specifically created to protest the integration of schools, unlike the KKK, which you know, has been around since the end of the Civil War, white citizens councils only come into being in 1954-1955 uh, and uh, their focus was on halting the integration of schools. Another slight difference between the white citizens councils and the KKK was the composition of their membership. Council members were typically middle class members of southern society, unlike the KKK, which largely drew from working class members. Middle class to upper class citizens flocked to these white citizens council meetings and many of them were able to use economic intimidation to protest the integration of schools. For example, a white citizens council member might be the president of a local bank. So they might deny loans to black families who supported school integration or a white citizens council member might be a physician in the local town and he might uh, deny service, deny care to black patients if they supported the integration of schools. 
employers might call their employees in and say, I understand, Mr. Robinson, that you support the integration of schools. I see that you're a member of the NAACP. Uh, you're going to lose your job unless you abandon support for this issue. That's what I mean by using economic intimidation. The Ku Klux Klan often use physical intimidation, torture, sometimes murder right of uh, civil rights advocates so a slightly different tactic a slightly different composition to the white citizens councils versus the KKK why such sustained resistance though to the integration of schools largely it was a fear of miscegenation miscegenation simply means interracial romantic relationships since the days of slavery white southerners greatest fear was that there would be a development of relationships across racial lines and that this would undermine their social superiority, that it would undermine whites' economic and political dominance should there be equality when it came to romantic relationships. Why is this fear of miscegenation attached to the integration of schools? For white Southerners, they feared that if black and white school children, starting at a very young age, were in mixed classrooms, that as they grew into middle school and high school, that romantic relationships would also develop between these schoolmates. As Alabama Senator Walter Given stated, the real purpose of the campaign to desegregate the schools was, quote, to open the bedroom doors of our white women to Negro men. Sexual jealousy was a potent component of the anti-integration backlash among Southern whites. To give a, another example of how tense race relations were in the South, especially regarding the topic of sexuality between blacks and whites, we need look no further than the torture and murder of a 14-year-old boy by the name of Emmett Till in Mississippi in 1955. Till was from Chicago and was spending the summer of 1955 with relatives in Money, Mississippi. While the boy had experienced segregation in his hometown of Chicago, it, this was something far greater in scope than he could have ever even realized once he got down to Mississippi during that summer. Reportedly, he made a sexual advance towards the wife of a local business owner, a man, a, a woman by the name of Carolyn Bryant. She told her husband, and four days later, two men came to the cabin of Emmett Till's uncle, a man by the name of Mose Wright. In the middle of the night, they snatched up the boy, and he was never seen alive after that. A countywide manhunt was put into effect, and three days after that, Emmett Till's body was found in the Tallahatchie River. One eye was gouged out. His crushed-in head had a bullet in it. The corpse was nearly unrecognizable. His grieving mother, Mamie Bradley, had his remains shipped back to Chicago and then insisted on an open casket funeral and invited the press to come and see what they had done to her child. As for justice, two local white men, one of them the owner of the store, were brought to trial. An all-white jury quickly found both men not guilty of the murder. Several months after the men had been acquitted of all charges, they agreed to give an interview in a national magazine bragging about how they had tortured the child and ultimately murdered him. The fear of miscegenation was so strong in the South during this period that a child could be murdered simply for acting supposedly disrespectful towards a white woman. The Emmett Till case, though, garnered national and international coverage, and for many Americans, they were shocked and horrified that not only had this child suffered, but that this sort of race-based terrorism was still going on in the United States by the 1950s. Little Rock, Arkansas will be the first real test of desegregating schools in the South. In 1957, nine black students will begin registering to attend the formerly all-white Central High School in the city. 
Although local officials had already reluctantly made plans to initiate integration, the governor of the state of Arkansas, Orville Faubus, had a different view. Faubus, a staunch segregationist, instead ordered the state's National Guard to Little Rock with the specific purpose of physically blocking the black students' registration and attendance at Central High. The governor claimed that if black students were allowed to attend school with whites, quote, blood will run in the streets, unquote. Faubus' actions soon drew national attention and the eye of President Eisenhower. The president decided to nationalize the troops in Arkansas. He nationalized the State Guard, bringing it under the control of the United States government, and he forced the governor to back down, allowing the integration of the schools to take place. The struggle in Little Rock and throughout the South were still not over, though. Now the students were exposed to angry attacks from local whites. Black students attempting to enter Central High were the focus of white hatred. They were spit upon, tripped in hallways, had rotten tomatoes thrown at them. They even received death threats over the phone every night. And other school districts across the South, Dallas, Orlando, Atlanta, what have you, were watching very closely what was taking place in Little Rock that year. What they will decide to do is simply close their public schools rather than integrate them. Even Little Rock decided to close its schools one year later rather than continue the process of desegregating them. The result was that in many areas all public schools were closed for a period of time so neither white nor black students were getting an education in the meantime. Eventually we will see new all-white private schools being opened instead and with a private school they did not fall under the terms of the Brown versus Board of Education decision that was only publicly funded schools. Private schools which derive their income from charging tuition to the students and their families there was no law on the books requiring that private schools must be integrated. So eventually when public schools reopen in these areas where all white private schools uh, have come into existence you basically still have segregated schools. In light of the fact that local and state authorities throughout the South were fierce opponents of integrating schools, area civil rights leaders began working for reform in other areas, oftentimes putting themselves at significant risk. A good example of a local homegrown civil rights movement was that which emerged in the city of Montgomery, Alabama in 1955 and 1956. In that city, although the majority of the clientele on the city's buses were African American, about 60% of the riders were, black passengers were often singled out for abuse by bus drivers and passengers alike. Moreover, the city's bus system was segregated, not by bus, but within each bus. On each bus there was a whites only section towards the front and a black section toward the back. And any time a white passenger boarded the bus, black passengers were expected to uh, give up their seat even if it was in the black section of the bus. In December of 1955, Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to obey Alabama's segregation law that mandated black riders give up their seats on buses to white riders. For her disobedience, Parks was summarily arrested. Parks was a long-time NAACP worker and had trained extensively in civil rights activity. After her arrest, local black leaders organized a boycott on all city buses. They hoped that the city would begin to feel the financial pinch of its black riders no longer utilizing that service. So they boycotted the buses, they organized uh, carpools, ride-share programs, they, people were walking to work, bicycling to work, and this incited a strong, angry, and violent backlash among the re white residents of Montgomery, Alabama. Over that long winter of 1955-1956, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. will become a seminal part of this protest. We'll pick up with his role in the Montgomery bus boycott in the second part of this lecture.